This morning's scripture reading is Paul's second letter to Thessalonians chapter 3. So let us together turn in God's word to 2 Thessalonians 3. So we read God's word as follows. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way, The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So far this scripture reading. Let's turn now to our text, Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 11. This morning's message is based on God's Word as we find it in Proverbs 6, starting at verse 6, where we read these words, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So that's our text from Proverbs 6. 6 through 11, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, tomorrow is Labor Day, and that is a holiday that is often viewed as the last long weekend or the last hurrah before the kids head back to school. It's the unofficial marker of the end of summer and when autumn begins. Now, Labor Day, uh, the holiday, has a history uh, in the 19th century, so the 1800s, the late 1800s, uh, tied to 
the early labor unions, uh, which undertook a movement or action or demonstration to advocate for more reasonable work hours. And what they were demonstrating for was to reduce their daily labor to nine hours a day and to six days a week. So obviously, in those days, companies demanded much more of their workers than they do today. We won't address this morning the ethics of labor unions. Uh, we won't address uh, the ethics of uh, what is a, an appropriate work week. But we will simply focus this morning on the fact of labor itself, the act of labor that we are all called to labor. So indeed, we ask the question, can we as Christians commemorate Labor Day in our own way, setting aside the concept that this is our last holiday before the busy season of school and uh, study? Can we commemorate labor in our own way? Can we use this holiday to reflect on the purpose of labor for Christians? Well, brothers and sisters, we can say this for sure. Labor Day indeed marks an important time of the year for Christians. Indeed, school is about to begin. A new study season gets underway. Catechism instruction starts. Home visit season gets into full swing. There will be again before us regular voluntary opportunities, etc. Our schedules will get organized. They will fill up quickly. Things will get busy. So we can talk today about the purpose of our work, the purpose of our busyness, the purpose of our business. Why do we bother with it at all? For the young people and the children, why do we bother study? But not only that, we also have to consider the manner of our work. Why should we try hard? Why not just do the bare minimum? Why should we put in all the effort? Such matters are addressed in our text this morning. And the wise man, the author of the book of Proverbs, has some advice, has some wisdom for us when it concerns our work and labor and all our tasks. And we need to pay heed to this advice, brothers and sisters, boys and girls. Such wisdom will lead us to fear the Lord. So this morning, we hear God's word under this theme, honor God by working with busy hands. That's how we summarize the message. Honor God by working with busy hands. We'll see two things, the manner of this work, and secondly, the fruit of this work. So first of all, let's consider the manner of this work and see what our text says and directs us concerning that. As a teacher of wisdom, the author of Proverbs is addressing, in our text, the sluggard. Now, that's not a compliment, and I'm pretty sure most of you realize that. A sluggard is someone who is sluggish, and that means lethargic, slow to respond, lazy. Most of us know what a slug is. A large, slimy, worm-like animal you find in damp places, like in your garden on a dewy summer morning, or by some tap. That slug moves very slowly. Sometimes it appears to sit around all day doing nothing. It appears to have no purpose 
or destination. The word slug even sounds slow or lazy, or maybe it sounds slow and lazy because it is. It's an appropriate name. And sluggard is too. The wise man is saying, some people behave like slugs. They are sluggards. That's a strong theme actually in the book of Proverbs. For example, listen to what it says in Proverbs 20, verse 4. We read there, the sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. Chapter 13 of this book says, also in verse 4, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Lastly, we'll consider verse 5 or 25 of chapter 21, which says, The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. So, a common theme of the wise man addressing our activity and labor in the kingdom. Many times the author comes back to this point and it tells us something. It tells us that sluggishness is common. What it tells us is that it's humanly natural and it's something that can affect us all. That is to say, it's, it's a consequence of the sinfulness of this life. An underlying principle revealed in this matter of sluggishness is that people will not get to work or their task will not get done when they are lazy or slow and will not achieve God's purpose and will. So herein lies the seriousness of the matter of our text this morning. In Scripture, we read that God gave our first parents, Adam and Eve, many tasks to fulfill, a creation mandate. He also gave them the ability and the resources to do them well. Their life, as a result, had purpose and potential. And that was to glorify and honor God in the work of their hands with the gifts and abilities God gave. But we see the results when they sinned, when they rebelled. They lost the glorious gift of putting their complete and full dedication in service to their God. Sin made them sluggish and slow and lazy. Not only that, they would experience many things. Uh, Genesis speaks about thorns and thistles and weeds that will slow them down. Another image in the book of Proverbs that helps us to understand this sluggishness we also find in our text and that is when it makes reference to sleep. In verses 9 and 10, we read that, How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest? When people are sleeping, they're not working. It's an obvious fact. They're not getting their work done. They're not fulfilling their purpose. Sleep helps to escape the surrounding circumstances. It helps us to forget about our problems for a while. This is why sometimes people sleep in so they don't have to face the day's challenges. 
in some cases, not all, because sometimes it's needed, but in some cases, sleeping in is the opposite of working and action and service and duty. God, put it this way, it, it would be foolish, brothers and sisters, if God doesn't want us to sleep. For sleep is also portrayed in Scripture as a blessing. And it's a blessing from God. David sings in Psalm 4, verse 8, for example, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And Psalm 127 makes reference to it. He gives, God gives to his beloved sleep. Sleep is a blessing. Sleep is an image of safety and security, of trust and, and of health and well-being. But just like we must not be lazy and we must not be a sluggard, we also must not abuse God's gift and blessing of sleep for our own purposes. In other words, we may not love sleep. Sleep is a gift to be utilized to enhance and help us in our tasks. In Proverbs 20, verse 13, we read this. Love not sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes, and you will have plenty of bread. In other words, there is a time for sleep, and God gives that. But when that time for sleep is over, we must rise and take up our tasks and do them diligently. This can be applied to all forms of rest, not just nightly sleep. It can refer also to our holidays or our times of vacation or any time off from our task and work. These are all gifts from God to be used for His glory that we may not abuse and to be used to re-energize ourselves for our daily tasks. Now this is seen in no better way than by the image that the wise man also brings up in our text and now calls us to. He says, go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. He's saying to the uh, people of Palestine, he's saying, go outside to an anthill or go to the threshing floor and observe one of these many ants. Observe the way they work. Much can be learned from those observations. Now normally we would consider an ant to be a pest, especially when they invade our homes or our picnics. When we see an ant, our, immediately, our immediate tendency is to squash it and step on it or to set a trap. However, from this tiny creature, God wants to teach us a most important lesson. For although the ant is tiny, it works very hard. It's always working hard. It's always on the march for food. All summer long and throughout the harvest, the ant is at work collecting food for the winter months. Actually, the ant that's referred to here in Proverbs 6 is the harvester ant. There are many species of ants that can be said to store its provisions in summer, but there are few that so obviously as the harvester ant that also gathers food at harvest. Most ant nests will lay dormant during the winter months, but not the harvester ant. It needs food for the whole year. And so it works diligently when the time allows. The wise man says, go to the harvester ant. Observe this incredible little creature at work. Two things especially can be observed about this ant. One, 
It doesn't work under compulsion or under a leader. It simply does its task. It never works only when others are observing or watching. Our text says, without having any chief, officer, or ruler, the ant never looks for an easy break. Rather, it's always fulfilling its purpose that God meant for it. So it doesn't work under compulsion or under eye service, as Paul would later say in, in his letters. Secondly, the ant always works with the future in mind. It's always working to prepare for the time when it will not find any food. Somehow, the little creature knows this and works hard. It works hard while there is time to do so. Well, brothers and sisters, the wise man teaches us, just like the ant has a duty to perform in its life, so also do we. The wise man asks us to consider our duties and tasks and our performances of them. God has given to us talents and gifts. In Jesus Christ, we are his children and he again enables us and gives us with resources. So we must seek to use them all to fulfill our task to his glory. As we look to the ant, we see that there is a proper time and a way to do our work, our jobs. It's important then, boys and girls, that you study carefully in school so that you can be ready later with the future in mind when you will be active in the workforce and in God's kingdom. It's important that dad works faithfully during the week so that there will be enough food on the table and money to pay for the daily necessities as well as to provide for future or for, for kingdom causes to help the poor. Mom also is to work faithfully and dedicate herself each day so that when the day is over, the family is ready for the next day. We are all to apply ourselves fully and completely in the task that God places before us. We are to work hard and diligently with our hands to God's honor. God doesn't tolerate laziness or procrastination or half-hearted efforts. He doesn't tolerate our lame excuses to our teacher, our boss, our spouse, or our parent. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Or consider what it says in his letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, starting at verse 23. Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Yes, boys and girls at school, when you do your work well, when you work hard to learn, then you are serving the Lord Christ. Your task, boys and girls, is to serve the Lord Christ in school. Well, how can we do it? How are we able? Is not our ability to work hard and diligently lost in the fall into sin? Yes, it is. We heard this. But... As we also saw in our reading in 2 Thessalonians 3, or also considered now in 1 Corinthians 15 and Colossians 3, God testifies to us in the Holy Spirit that our ability 
and our gifts to work hard and diligently is restored in Jesus Christ. Through His Spirit, we are once again able to do our task to the pleasure of God more and more. In John 17, verse 4, the Lord Jesus declares in his high priestly prayer that he did as the Father commanded him. He fulfilled his task and ministry. Why? So that the world might know that he loved the Father. We too are in the power of the Holy Spirit to work hard and diligently so that the world might know that we love God the Father. Because the very work the Father asked of the Son was completed and finished and accomplished, we too are able to complete and finish and accomplish our work. Later, the disciple Thomas saw the evidence of that hard work on Christ's hands and in his side. Jesus was diligent in his task so that once again we can be. Jesus refrained from sluggishness and laziness so that we also can refrain from it. Yes, in Jesus Christ, our office and task are restored. We can do it in his power and energy that he gives in the Holy Spirit. Let's also consider this morning the fruit of this work as our text addresses it. Because our work depends on Jesus Christ, it is important, brothers and sisters, that we begin every day again in prayer and devotion to Jesus Christ and to God, knowing that without God, without His blessing, we cannot even begin to hope to be diligent in our daily tasks. Without God's blessing and provision, there will be no positive fruits on our work. Only when we know God's will in Jesus Christ and so follow the example of the ant will there be good fruits. Proverbs very often speaks also of the fruits of our work by placing the man who is lazy up against the one who works diligently. We call that juxtaposing. Juxtaposing the man who is lazy with the one who works diligently. And not surprisingly, we see in these cases that the fruit of work is also very different. The wise man shows this by alluding to all sorts of examples and we see the practical nature of wisdom then and how we can apply it to our daily lives. Let me read for you, for example, what, we, what it says in Proverbs 10, verse 5. It says, He who gathers in summer, so think of the ant again, he who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. What the wise man is saying is that we have to make the best of our opportunities. We have to make the most of the time that God gives us and allots to us. In chapter 12, verse 27, we read, whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. The wise man is saying is that the lazy one will not catch his prey. The lazy one will not have food on the table. In another book of wisdom literature, in the book of Ecclesiastes, verse, chapter 10, verse 18, it says, 
Through sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house leaks. Literally there in the original where it says sloth, it says, the one who lets his hands hang down, like that. The one who has his hands in his pockets. That's a typical image of one who doesn't do hard work. In chapter 24 of Proverbs, verses 30 to 31, it says, I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Yes, if things are left undone, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, there will be suffering. If husbands are sitting all evening in front of the TV watching sports and something must be done around the house and is left undone, well, then eventually over time the house will be broken down. If wives are reading books all day and watching soap operas, things are not getting done around the house either. If young people or children are every, are every free hour of the day in front of the computer or the Xbox or the Switch or social media or some sort of form of screen, their work will be left undone. The Apostle Paul fights against, condemns laziness and idleness in our reading 2 Thessalonians 3, which we read together. It was actually common in Paul's day for many not to work. There were people who actually believed in Paul's day that it was a sign of great piety if you spent your whole day sitting in meditation. There were actually some people who would sit all year long on top of a pole, supposedly thinking about the Lord. You can think about the hermits of the early centuries. The people would separate themselves from life in order to, to meditate. They supposed that the Lord was pleased with that kind of idleness. But Paul clearly states in this passage in our reading that the Lord doesn't tolerate idleness. It pleases the Lord to give us our blessings through our labors. It pleases the Father to send His Son to restore us to our creation mandate and tasks so that we are not weary in well-doing so that we do our task to the glory of God and for his kingdom. That's why we read on many occasions in the New Testament about the virtues of working hard with our hands. God gives us today in Christ the responsibility to work hard, to study hard in this life for our well-being. He gives us tasks that we must fulfill. And to not do so, instead to be lazy, slothful, a sluggard, is to go against the will of the Lord and is not fearing the Lord. On the other hand, through diligence, we serve God and will be blessed with many fruits. We should be energetic and enthusiastic. We must also bear in mind not to be workaholics. Such a person no longer does everything for the Lord. No longer is devoting all the task to the kingdom. Such a person is devoted to the self and, and to the business. Young people, children... Boys and girls, if you would like to have good results and blessings on your schoolwork, each according to the gifts that God has given to you, 
then you must work diligently with those gifts. God will not be pleased with a half-hearted effort. God is not pleased if you don't care. No, make a good effort to pay attention during class instruction. The older ones, be diligent to take good notes, to listen well, to pay attention, and study well for your tests and exams and to do your homework when there is homework. Use the gifts God gives. Do your best, and you will see the results. At the same time, have the future in mind. Laziness at school will result in fewer opportunities later in life. Well, brothers and sisters, let's conclude this morning what we've heard today from Proverbs 6. Let's do that by, first of all, not despairing this morning in the exhortation to work hard and diligently. Rather than despair, let us seek and find our energy and strength and power in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Let's also think what our Savior did for us, how hard he worked for our salvation and our well-being. Think of what Jesus gave up, of what pain he endured, of what entire weight of God's wrath rested on him as he hung on the cross for us so that we might have life. Yes, the pain and effort of Christ's hard work for us is evident on his hand, on his hands and on his forehead, on his ankles, on his back and on his side. Remember the hard work of Jesus Christ for you. And then in Jesus Christ, go to work, be busy with your hands, with your whole being to the honor of the Lord. Amen.